Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Dimitri Johnson, and you're listening to MMALatestNews.com. It's time to roll, baby. What is up, guys? Welcome back to the recap of Dustin Poirier versus Dan Hooker. We were treated to one of the fight of the year contenders, another one to add to the list this year. It was a cracking, cracking fight. I'm here with Orion and Jay. Jay, what did you make of this weekend's bout between Dustin Poirier and Dan Hooker? It was, you know, it was touted to be a light heavyweight title, almost uh, eliminator. What did you make of it on Saturday night? Uh, well, it would be very special if it was a light heavyweight title eliminator. But lightweight, we'll let that sorry. Slide, Mitch. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so we spoke about it in the preview. Uh, I said like how good the fights have been since the UFC's return to action. And, you know, this was no different. This was definitely fight of the year for me. Um, I thought Dan Hooker looked very good in the earlier rounds. And as like the fight kind of played out, Poirier came on strong and he saw it out. But I think this is one thing that I'm very impressed with by Dustin Poirier. It's not just his his attributes or his ability. It's also a toughness that he has. And it's like he has it more than anybody else in the division because he, he can go to war, but he's the, only, he's the only one that comes out of war victorious. Now, I tend to agree with Daniel Cormier's comments recently about Dustin Poirier, how he's probably the best lightweight in the world who's not named to be in the I feel like with Poirier, he's been, he's been one of them guys, like, he's an all-around good guy. And he, I like seeing good things happen to good people. And I'm afraid that when it's all said and done for him, he won't, like, all he'll have to look back on is to say, right, it was the interim champ because I was around when Khabib Nurmagomedov was around. It's like football with Ronaldo and Messi. It's like you're the best of the rest. You know, and I, I, I think for good people like Poirier, that's almost uh, undeserving, you know. And I, I went over some of the stuff, like, if you look at who he's beaten, right? So he's won five of his last six fights. The only loss coming to the champion, Khabib, who no one has beaten. Yet Poirier gave him his closest run. You know, he hurt him, uh, I believe, in the second round, and he tried to get him out there with a choke in the third. You know, he's beaten former featherweight champion, Max Holloway, on two occasions, at featherweight and lightweight. He's beaten UFC and Bellator uh, lightweight champion Eddie Alvarez. He's beaten Anthony Pettis, who's also the former lightweight champion. He's beaten Justin Gaethje, who's now the current uh, interim champion at lightweight. Again, his only loss, is, well, not his only loss, but his most recent loss is to Khabib. So I feel like he's he's elite. Dustin Poirier is elite. He's not very good. He's elite. It just so happens that Khabib is on another level. And I would like to see... I never like want anybody to win a title. I like seeing fights play out and who wins. But I think Dustin Poirier is probably the first fighter that I really want to see get that title because he's like I said, he's an all around good guy. Like the cause that he brings with his good fight foundation, like the father that he is and stuff. It's great to see these things and I I think he deserves to be where he is right now. I think beating Dan Hooker was great for him. I know I'm going on a bit of a, a rant here, but um not so much a rant but whatever. Like beating Dan Hooker, it didn't do as much for him as it would have done for Hooker. Uh-huh. Right? So I think he is exactly where he needs to be. He's right under Gaethje. Gaethje needs that shot after what he's done to Tony Ferguson. But if there's anybody else, it should be there, Dustin Poirier. Because look, let's be honest, the big fight in lightweight doesn't involve Gaethje and it doesn't involve Poirier. It involves Conor McGregor. But let's be honest, Conor does not deserve that title fight, not after beating Cowboy. So it should be Gaethje. And if Poirier had the license to sit out and wait, he should be next after that for the lightweight title. He, he, he's simply the best lightweight, not named Khabib. Yeah, very much so. I agree with what you said there. I, I think... That was a fan. <laughs> Is that I a just feel strongly about it. I, like, <laughs> like, let's be honest. It's not just the fact that he's a good person, but you even see him when he fights. Like He, he goes to war with these people and he's the only one that comes out with his hand raised. He just has that like mental toughness that he knows he's gonna outlast you. Like Dan Hooker, who's been on a tear, right, comes out and he wins the first two rounds against Poirier. Them calf kicks, great, and Poirier just bites down and he's like, right, I'm gonna show you who I am. And yet he comes out with his arm raised. It's it's typical of Dustin Poirier, and I like seeing that stuff. Yeah, adding to that, as you as you said there, it almost reminds you of Michael Bisping, someone who was always. The nearly person, he almost, he, he almost, he would get that title shot or the number one contender spot and always lose it. 
Dustin Poirier is on a similar path there where hopefully he does eventually get that title shot, whether it means Khabib retires or Khabib loses the gates and we get that rematch. You know, I was looking today, lightweight, lightweight is the only division where all of the top five have been a world champion, whether it's in interim or the undisputed champion. The only division that comes close to that is a women's strawweight, which has four in it. But to have a division where the top five have all been champions at some point is absolutely ridiculous. And it really showed Ryan. It really showed Ryan, you know, the quality of the division and the quality of the top five, and in particular Dustin Poirier, because as we said, Dan Hooker was creeping up into that top five, but boy, he he did get beat down on on Saturday night. Yeah, and it's a it's it was it was like one of those fights where, like you know, before the Gaethje Ferguson fight, Dana was vouching for almost putting his head on the line, saying there is no way this isn't going to be a good fight. And this was, I think, it was in a similar category, but it was still it didn't have as much, I think, mainstream hype around it as as the other one. And yeah, the lightweight division is is I think it's one of those divisions where whatever fight would be made for the belt in that top five, there would be no complaints from anybody really. Even even if Connor snuck in there somehow, I don't think people would. Uh, would complain but yeah it's just one of those divisions and for Poria I think there is not a lot of fighters that aren't the champion but that have the cards in their hands in terms of what could happen next and I think he is in that position right now because he just proves time and time again the caliber of fire he is like Jay said and I actually tweeted about it right after the main event that if not for his takedown defense not being maybe I think that's his weakest link in his whole arsenal he would be a world champion. It's just, it's unfortunate at, at a time when Khabib, somebody like Khabib is the champion, you have to have an elite takedown defense, which is, I think, the only thing maybe that makes him and even makes Gaethje an even more dangerous contender against Khabib than what Poirier did. Because Poirier did show everyone what he's capable of. It's just he was not able to stay on his feet for, for a long amount of time. But, yeah, in that main event, it was Hooker started off nicely, I think, maybe to the surprise of a few people, but I think Poirier kind of got settled into that fight and he showed really that the levels, like Hooker is on the on the come up, but there are still levels in that division and Poirier showed, he just asserted his dominance from, I think, the, I, I, I thought from the second round on, but I think on the scorecards, it was from the third round on. He just went for it and yeah, it was incredible efficiency, great grappling uh, on the offensive end and it was it was pretty a pretty dominant victory uh, considering how the fight started. Yeah, I think he won the second round, funnily enough. I know the judges gave him three, four, and five. And Hooker finished strong in the second. But I thought Poirier done more of the work. I, even though Hooker landed more shots, I thought Poirier probably took that due to damage inflicted. I thought so as well. I thought I thought he landed the more significant. Even though the, in the quantity, Hooker outlanded him, I thought he landed the more damaging shots in that round as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I just rewatched it here a couple of minutes ago, and I do give Hooker the first two rounds. I definitely give him number one. Give him the second one just because of that that flurry of damage he did at the end. And if he had probably fifteen, twenty seconds more, he could have easily found himself a finish, perhaps because uh, Poirier was hurt. But the heart of Poirier and the toughness, and you know, he's been in those five round wars that we mentioned so many times, and his experience being in, in the trench has really pulled through. And he, he demolished him in those three rounds, almost similar to how Usman and Colby was where the champion or the interim or well, I guess Dustin Poirier title challenger really mounted the pressure and showed why he belonged in there and why he, he probably you know, he, pro- he isn't going to get a title shot immediately probably because obviously you've got to see Gaethje less it could be he's definitely the next, the next one but he, if he wants to stay active there's a certain Irishman that fans want to see him in there with once more and you know Connor's looking for a fight, Dustin Poirier is, is game as anything and that is probably the, the fight that it makes most sense. You could say Tony Ferguson, perhaps, but again, I don't want to see Tony Ferguson back of Yotskun. So, Jay, what would you say? Dustin Poirier versus Conor McGregor too? Yeah, like, it, it's very good, isn't it? Like, because it's very different to the last time they fought. Conor was on the rise and Dustin Poirier was the name that people knew about. Now, Dustin Poirier, yeah, he's, like I just said, how great he is. But that fight will, will basically determine the number one contender. You know, in my humble opinion, I feel like Gaethje, rightly so, and after that, it's Poirier. If Poirier chose to sit out, I would have no argument with it because he, I, I personally think he's he's that good. He deserves the fight for the title. But with Conor looking for a fight, it makes probably the most sense right now. Like, you, Conor, 
he has one win at welterweight over Cowboy. He's two wins at welterweight, one over Cowboy. But that does nothing for him in the lightweight rankings. I know how, like, everyone knows how big he is and that uh, he can just go like that and he's back into a title fight. And I, I've no problems with that when you're, you know, you're that big of a star and you're that good of a fighter. But, yeah, I'd probably just say, right, it makes the most sense to put them two together, but I don't see it happening. Like, I do, I'm of the same opinion. It's either Connor or Tony for Poirier if it's not going to be a title shot. So, yeah, that's the tricky one with Poirier and where he's at right now because, now, I did say this before, I don't believe Connor's retired. But will they Will they just, will they take that hit on bringing Connor back in this lockdown? I, I, I don't think so. So, I feel like it'll either be Ferguson for Poirier at the end of the year or else he'll probably just sit it out until... I don't know, maybe there's a crowd back again and then you, maybe you could do the Conor fight. Yeah, there was one name I sort of had, you know, it's weird, Conor's had more more wins at uh, welterweight than he has at lightweight, but yeah, he's in the lightweight title picture because of the name he brings. It's ridiculous how, how much power he does have, but I would like to see, you know, I believe Dustin Poirier had a better showing against Khabib in that fight, you know, they you could both build it as they, have the, uh, as they both lost to the champion. If Gaethje beats Khabib, I'd be, you know, Gaethje versus versus either of them. But I think Poirier having that win over Gaethje already maybe puts him in better stead. The other name that comes to mind is Nate Diaz, which was a fight that was meant to happen, I believe, at the UFC 244 or the MSG before it. That didn't quite go to plan. So if Dustin Poirier needs a fight, you know, at 170 against Nate Diaz, one that isn't too damaging towards his, his resume, that could be one that could be rebooked, Arian. Uh, I don't... I don't... I don't think so. I, I don't think it's... Well, it's not appealing to me really as a fan, so I don't know if it's going to be... I, I think the only two fights right now in the position that Poirier is in that get him maybe out of bed is Connor and Tony. And personally, I would like to see Tony take some time off because you just... You don't come back quickly after a fight like that and be like fully ready to go again into another war, I think. And I think... Yeah, for, it would be the best case scenario, I think, for Poirier in terms of money and in terms of getting a chance to run it back with McGregor. I just don't think he gains anything from beating Nate Diaz, whatever weight class it's at. And I think Nate Diaz, following the the McGregor fight and the the way that elevated him into like the money fight picture, I just don't think he, especially at one fifty five, but at one seventy either, he just isn't like the guy that you beat in order to. Uh, elevate your standing in a division. He's just a, he's a guy. He's an entertainer, but I don't think he's a he's a big player in either of the divisions. So I don't I don't think that would make sense. And I I can't see. And but you know, Nate Diaz fights are wars, and they will take a toll on you physically. So I just don't think that would be the best move for Poirier right now. I think I think the best case scenario if he can't get the title shot, which obviously right now it's it's booked up. So I think he will be the first reserve for that one. But if he can't, and if he wants to stay active, I think that Connor fight would be perfect for both of them. Because if mm-hmm. Connor comes into lightweight and he beats somebody like Poirier, then that automatically elevates his kind of position in that division as well. So I think we were saying a couple of weeks ago that Masvidal was the perfect fight for Connor. But I think now there's a, a few more options coming up. Yeah. Now. As things are playing out, I think, like Dana said, if Connor just sits back and lets things play out, then more fights are kind of starting to come up now that, oh, actually, that would be a good fight to see Connor in and get tested, and it would be good for the opposite party, too. So it's definitely getting interesting with the UFC back in the full swing. I agree with, um, with you there, Alec, how we did say that about Masvidal, and yet Poirier goes and presents this opportunity. Well, not an opportunity, but an option for Connor as well. But Touching on the Nate Diaz thing, I, I really don't feel like that's a fight that needs to happen at all. And I feel like that's uh, that's all Nate Diaz is doing, his own doing, because he fights very seldom, right? So when he does fight, he, he got beat by Masvidal. He beat Conor the first time round, got beat by Conor the second time, right? But like, what, what really has it done? Nate Diaz... Nate Diaz, like you said, Arian, has always been an entertainer. He's been fun to watch, don't get me wrong. When he fought for the title against Dos Anjos, I believe that was the title fight, wasn't it? Against Dos Anjos? Or was it Benson Henderson for the title? Nice. I think it was Benson Henderson, actually. It could be wrong. Anyway. But, yeah, when he fought for the title, like he was there, and rightly so, because he went on a good tear. Lately, it's just been, you win two, lose one. Win one, lose two. It's not entertaining. And the fact that he takes these huge gaps out in between fights, it gets boring to me. Like, 
that trilogy fight with Connor should have happened a long time ago. And everybody, the eyes, the whole world would be watching. But because he takes these absences and then he comes back and then he gets a good win over Pez, right, give me Masvidal. Okay, Masvidal beats him up. And then it's like, oh, they don't want me to win, you know? It's like, nah, mate. It, but that's just how it is. It's like, just accept it, get back in there and, and fight. He just doesn't like fighting. And if that's how it is, full respect to him. If you don't like fighting, because I, I know Nick said he didn't like fighting before. So if that's what it is, no problem. We understand. That's grand. But don't sit there and act like you're this big deal when you're taking two years out and you come back for a good fight and then you take another two years out. Like he, Nate Diaz doesn't seem like the type of fighter to me who wants to be a UFC champion. He just wants that payday. And again, full respect, I, I probably wouldn't mind being in his position. But I don't feel like he's where fighters need to get to in order to go to the title shot. I think people are past that he's, mm-hmm. he's, the, he's, a, he's a certain money fight but he's not enough to get you a number one contender that's my uh, just to add on to that the, the thing for me with Diaz is that he's only half the package that Dana wants for the money fights like he will give you the entertainment in the cage not necessarily by he won't win but he will always be on the end of a, of a very good fight but he's not mm-hmm. that promotable in terms of the trash talk and stuff like that he's kind of a, in his own bubble kind of a personality it's just how Nate has always been, and Nick too. They're they're kind of. I think Nick was a bit better at the at the war of words than than what Nate was, especially with the Connor stuff. It was more comedy than actually real, like you know, back and back and forth. But um, yeah, I think ever since that Connor fight, Nate just got the notion that he became the the draw, which I don't think is that like true. I think he is he is a draw in terms of like entertaining fights, but I just don't think he is that money fight that somebody like McGregor is. That you know, if you see that name on the poster, you are tuning in, you're buying the pay per view. I don't think Nate is quite there yet, and I don't think he ever was really. And like Jay said, I understand that that's that might be what is his goal right now. He just might be money oriented when it comes to fights, and that's fine. But I just don't think there is that many money fights there for him. So I think the only way for him to like maybe get to that level is to stay active and keep fighting, but he doesn't want to do that either. So it's kind of a difficult position. And I think there has a, a lot of buzz from that trilogy fight with Connor has kind of went out as well over time. So it's a difficult position, I think, to get him back into the picture now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a, diff- it's a difficult one, and especially with who is in that lightweight division. There's a much more appealing fight to Dustin Poirier, as you, as you both mentioned, and I agree. I'd rather see him against the likes of Conor or Tony and get a true lightweight number one contender match rather than someone fighting in the world's weight division and being granted that lightweight title shot. I think that's, you know, it's okay for Conor. Well, it's not okay, but it works for Conor because it's Conor. But really, you yeah. need to have... Sorry, miss. If I can just add, just before we, we change that topic completely, I know what I'm saying about Diaz, how he fights every so many years. Now, I do understand it probably you sound a little bit hypocritical. Maybe if it's because of my accent, I don't know. But Conor McGregor has been doing that a lot lately as well. But the point I'm making is that Conor's been there. Conor, he, he can do that now that he became the star. You know what I mean? He became the two-way world champion. He got millions of views all over like, globally. You know, he, he's bigger than the sport. So that's what I mean. Like, like Nate Diaz was never there. You know, like, what? look at... How, what do you reckon his views were against Anthony Pettis compared to the ones against Masvidal? Or maybe the fight against Michael Johnson before he fought Connor. You know, they're totally different. You have to weigh these things up and realise who's the star. Now, Nate Diaz, like Arian said, he brings the entertainment factor. Where you, it's hard to promote him. You know, you can promote him as this bad boy who's always against the company. He's like Stone Cold Steve Austin. But he'll only get so far with it. it it's not uh, predetermined. So, I don't know. I just think Connor, like Connor, does that with the fighting every so often, because he's been there, he's made the money, he can do what he wants, and he knows people are going to tune in. I don't think it's the same way with Nate Diaz. Mm-hmm. Definitely, and I think you know, the last time we saw Connor McGregor Poirier right, was at featherweight division. It was a very young Dustin Poirier. It was up and coming, and it'd be interesting now to see. I don't think it'd be the same outcome in terms of the first round finish. I think Poirier's got a lot better with his boxing. His wrestling's got a lot better. You saw. He picked up some of Khabib's almost mannerisms in his fight against Hooker with some of the things he'd done. It was only really the, the not crossing the legs during his groundwork that he didn't really I know you that. Know, use the fighting job. But there were times where you, if you took a picture of Khabib and placed it over that fight, you'd say, 
it's pretty much the same same move. So it'd be interesting to see what Poirier does. And I'd almost be tempted, almost almost slightly edge it towards him. It's a, it's a difficult one to score. Listen, he's 100% in the equation. Like that, that's by no means is that an easy fight for Connor. Now, I, I do like. I think if you got Connor who showed up for Nate one, I would say Poirier beats him. If you got Connor who showed up for Nate two, I say Connor beats him. Mm. It, it's such a weird thing. Well, because it all depends on one person what you're gonna get. Because Connor, when he's hungry, is so good. Yeah. I think it's not. You, see, you tend to see what happens even with the Khabib fight. I think what plays into Dustin's maybe advantage, if you want to call it that, at 155, is that he, his chin doesn't carry over well into 145. Yeah. Where yeah, I was just about to say that. Yeah. You can tell he 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 can go into a war. He can get hit, and he will not stop. Uh, he will not start backing down from you. So, and I know that McGregor's the way he hits is is just it's different. Nobody hits like him, and it's not necessarily in terms of power, but it's just the way he hits you and where he hits you. Speed. It would be interesting to see uh, how how that second one comes down. Because yeah, I think I think Poirier is a completely different fighter than than what we saw in the first one, and I think that's clear, obviously, by seeing what he has made of his his career since then. All you have to look at is the like I, I mentioned it, like the list of champions that he's beaten already. Again, okay, and right, he lost to. Was it Michael Johnson was his last loss after Khabib or before Khabib? Uh, yes. Johnson was yeah, yeah. Like Johnson. He smokes Michael Johnson right now. You put them two in lightweight, featherweight, he washed you Michael Johnson. You know, I think just the unfortunate thing right now is that he has Khabib and Amagamento ahead of him. Because I believe if he fought Gaethje again, he beat Gaethje again. It's just stylistically, I, I believe, Poirier just has that grit. Yeah, it's kind of crazy you say that as well, you know. If you look at his, his notable wins, Dan Hooker, Max Holloway, Anthony Pettis, all former featherweights that have moved up to lightweight and he's got wins over them in that division. So you could easily, you know, Connor's in that same in that same path, a former featherweight who's moved up to lightweight. It is a tremendous fight. But I think we move on to Dan Hooker, who, you know, he did lose that fight. I feel sorry for him. He's come all the way over from, from New Zealand and he's got a quarantine now for the next two weeks. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's unruly for him. But I guess... He did look good. His stock didn't exactly fall too much. He, no. He's in the right position. He's at number five. But it depends on what he does next. Maybe a Charles Oliveira, perhaps. Yeah, I think I think to me, Dan Hooker is like a version of Justin Ga- Gaethje that just doesn't hit as hard. Like, that man can take damage. The, the last two fights, is, it's ridiculous. I like He's another one that I'd like to take a little bit of time off because he's a broad. Mm-hmm. Although he is quite polished with his skill set. Like, he's hard to take down. He's got a pretty good stand-up. He doesn't, I don't, yeah, like, like I said, I don't think he hits hard enough to just knock some of those 155ers out who are tough as nails. But, yeah, I don't think his stock uh, lessened at all after, after that one. Like, he, he might have the best chin in the division because that man doesn't get, he doesn't even get wobbled when he gets hit. He just eats everything. His face was reconstructed at the end of the fight and he was, like, smiling. He was fine. He's got a good gas tank. It's just, yeah, I think it's just maybe... A little bit too soon. Maybe this this loss will do him good in terms of getting back to the drawing board and you know coming back up because he's not going to drop in rankings. So, but he, this might be maybe an opportunity for somebody like Oliveira to get a fight with somebody near the top five, which is again a good fight I think for Hooker maybe to take just a little step back and refocus and then go again. I was thinking that like how come like how has nobody been dropped in that fight? <laughs> I remember thinking about like every time I've watched it two or three times now, and I was like, "How did no one go down?" Like just some serious bombs being thrown. And I think for Dan Hooker, like listen, Dan Hooker, does anyone's stock really go down when you have a war like that? Exactly. Like I, I don't think so. I think it only elevates. And I think that was a a big thing for him. I think he, he showed like Ari and you touched on it earlier. There's just a certain level to where Paul is at compared to Dan Hooker. But by no means like can he not get there? Of course he can. Like, it just takes a bit of time. But losing to Dustin Poirier is, is no slouch. I get it. No one likes to lose at all. But losing to Dustin Poirier, I mean, <laughs> there's not a whole lot like, to be unhappy with yourself from. Do you know what I mean? You can easily come back from it. And I would not be surprised to see them two fight again down the line. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, I, I was almost backing him coming into this one just because I like what City Kickboxing are doing. Now, I guess it probably helps with your sparring, probably Adesanya and Volkanovski. Those are the two very heavy hitters that you're working with in that gym. Now, I'll throw a little, you know, a couple of stats at you. 289 total strikes were sprung for Poirier, 283 from da- uh, Dan Hooker, 182 landed for Hooker, and 208 from Dustin Poirier. 
So they both threw incredible Accuracy. volumes. Incredible Accuracy. volumes. And it's, Boy it's, is like a sniper. I think Boy yeah. had it at a 74% uh, rate. That I think I checked that on Fire Now, which is it's ridiculous. <laughs> that man does not hit you with anything he doesn't mean. He hits it's, you with everything like you stole his lunch money. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that with Eddie Alvarez? Where he just like was four left hands in a row, like not even a pullback on the right. It was just left hands constantly. He's he's slick. He's slick. His hands are so nice, man. They're so good. Yes, crazy. He did he did crazy damage. Another person who did a lot of damage was Mike Perry. You know, he had his one corner member, but it paid off for him. He looked great against Mickey Gore around. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 actually like I wonder, like for some fighters, maybe that helps when you have just no voices in your head when you go to sit down. Because I'm pretty sure he said that uh, at one point, or maybe it was in an interview, that I was actually able to think when I sat down uh, in between rounds. Which maybe for some fighters, and maybe not necessarily at the highest level, you know, he's not a championship contender at the moment. It was a very much middle of the division fight, but it might be some truth in it that he was able to see what what's going on unfolding in the fight he sat down he analyzed it himself and he kind of figured out what he needed to do and it was a very complete fight from him he was very good on the feet he was very good taking mickey gall down who we've known from from him being an offensive grappler so it was um i don't know if anybody was expecting this kind of a performance but it was arguably one of mike perry's best performances i think today yeah how complete it was and how very efficient he was with his output and he didn't take that much damage for a mike perry fight it was still violent but it was very more one-sided than i think we've gotten used to so hey latori gonzalez is one i know who knows who knows what the future holds uh it's, it's crazy what what happened this week you know he almost gave her more advice than she gave him in the fight telling her where to put the ice saying she looks great that was the best part about it. <laughs> she put that ice on so good. <laughs> yeah, I love my party. I love my party. It's crazy, you know. I think we did a pre with Lance and yourself. It was like, what happens to Mickey Go? How does, does he almost feel humiliated losing to that, like in that fashion? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, I, I, I thought about it. Like when you. Bring in like a very unexperienced or inexperienced, you know, corner woman who's your girlfriend. I, I I don't know. I think after going through a full camp with your own team, preparing to beat someone, and yeah, he just rolls in with his girlfriend and does three rounds easy over you, you know. And like you said, it was probably one of his better performances. Now it was probably the like standard of like the level drop, maybe you know. That probably has a part to play in it. But at the end of the day, Mickey Gall had, like, I did say this as well, Mickey Gall has the ability there to finish a fight if need be. So I thought Mike Perry looked excellent. On, like you said, Arian, on the feet, on the ground, clinch work, you know, takedowns were nice. I thought he looked excellent. I wouldn't advise him, him to, you know, continue with this pattern, you know. I think while he finds the time to get a new crew, I know he wants Yoel Romero to be his main train, training partner. He's looking for a certain Englishman to fight as well. So that that would be something. I don't see that happening, but I, I welcome the Twitter wars with it. I think just to touch on Mickey Gall really quick, I think it's got to be really discouraging, as Perry was saying in the post-fight uh, interviews, that they were shouting codes and stuff that he was figuring out slowly of how to attack Perry and stuff, and it's just nothing's working. And a man that's fighting by himself with no advice is literally finding every answer. <laughs> He's, he's answering every question you can possibly throw at him. So it's got to be really deflating to come out of a fight like that. And it might, it yeah. might be tough to bounce back from it. But, hey, that's how, I think that's how you see whether you've got it or not. It's, it's going to be character testing for sure. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, I think we've got our coach of the year nailed in the bag. I think it was Trevor Whitman coming into this weekend. But Lafrey Gonzalez has just nicked it with, with one and out. Imagine if, she, if Mike Perry fights again and they do the same thing and she goes two and out. Like how long did this undefeated streak go I on? Hope he wins the belt with her just in this corner. <laughs> She'll be better than Chael Son and she can take that Chael Son in Monica undefeated and undisputed. <laughs> Latori Gonzalez, coach of the year. Oh, it's ridiculous. It, it's one, you do see some bizarre things in MMA, but I think, I, I don't know if that's the most bizarre. I said last there. week, right? I said last week and I watched it back and I was like, I sound stupid saying that, right? I said, uh, Latori Gonzalez against 
uh, Diego Sanchez, Guru, Josh, Josh with Fabia or something like that. I mean that right now. I don't care if it sounds even worse. Like, that was so like, interesting in terms of, right, she's not an experienced coach, but this guy's out here doing that to people and they're like, <laughs> who cares? I'm here for all the, all the, the content, all the shenanigans that come with it. I want to see that. I don't care. I'll go, I'll stick by that. I'll be pissed oh. off if I don't see that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Mike Perry did look, you know, the best we've seen him. It was, it's interesting, it's the first almost opponent he's faced that wasn't ranked in quite a while with his, you know, Jeff Neal and Vicente Luque and his most recent uh, losses before that. But we do move to Morris Green, the versus Gian Valente. He pulled off almost an upset of the night with his last minute uh, finish there. Ryan, what did you make of Gian Valente and Morris Green's fight? Uh, everything about Valante going into that fight looked terrible. Like I was, I was, I was actively actually like a little bit worried because he didn't look in great shape. He didn't look very confident in his, just his overall demeanor. It looked like he had a limp walking into the octagon. But actually, when the fight started, he didn't look half bad. His his power carried over pretty well, and he was able to not take that much damage. Um, I think I think his coaches were, I don't know, maybe a little bit too aggressive with him. And, and they wanted him to open up a lot. I think I said it to to everyone in the in the chat during the fights that they, it's it's they're they're begging for him to get knocked out by how they're advising him to go against the guy that's way longer and probably stronger in that division. But I think um, the the way he fights carried over pretty well. But I just think he gassed. Like the the submission that he got that he got um, tapped out by wasn't wasn't even locked in. It was just kind of a like uh, more of an exhaustion kind of thing that I just can't do this anymore. Rather than I'm, I'm, I'm being choked out here. And it's unfortunate because he's one of those fighters that was highly rated at one point and it's just kind of never worked out for him. And he's turned into a bit of a journeyman and he's losing more than he's winning. But at least he didn't take that much damage in that fight. And I, I guess it, it's, it's an option there for him now that he could try again because he didn't look terrible. I think if he improves his cardio a little bit in that division, it's not necessarily going to be a top 15 or a top 10 fighter, but he could have some nice fights and make some more money in that division without maybe killing himself to cut down to 205 because it looked like he enjoyed himself in the build-up to that fight by, by how he looked heading into the octagon. Yeah, it's crazy to see, really. He was about, I don't know how long the ref was around, I see what, about 15, 20 seconds, or actually a minute and a half, to say. He was a minute and a half away from winning that, probably 29, 28. It, it was a good performance, but unfortunately he did get tapped out and he did gas and, you know, it's one of those things, but it doesn't doesn't help him, does it? No, it's the thing with Jean Valente, like he Arian said as well, he's kind of very popular around the time Chris Weidman blew up as the middleweight champion. You know, they were good friends and wherever else. I don't know. They, anytime you see Weidman, you see Jean Valente, and then when people start paying more attention to Jean's fights when Chris was the champion because of this success Chris was having, you know, and then. He would do all right here and there. But I would love to know what happened to where this level of inconsistency came from because, like you said, like I, the picture of him at weigh-ins, I mean, he just it didn't look great whatsoever. Like I could almost feel the outcome before the fight even took place. And that's not a good thing. Like you, you don't, you know, I don't want to see a fight when I already know who's going to win and I already know, you know, how someone's going to perform. Now, like you said, you, there was some surprises in there in terms of his performance, but I don't know where he goes from here. I don't know if he stays with the UFC. I don't know if he fights again under unranked heavyweight. I don't know if he should try and take it serious and go back to light heavyweight. I don't know. It's just, it's a very tough one for him. And I think for, you know, the guy he lost there, I don't even forget his name, but it's Norris be, Green. It completely just flew out of my head. <laughs> Norris Green, yeah. I was going to say a different color there for a second. Um, yeah, like, like being Jan Valente as well, that doesn't do much to elevate you neither. So it's, I think it was a lose lose for both people, if I'm being perfectly honest. Yeah, you know, Morris Green did get called out by, you know, Tanner Bosa, who had a brutal knockout against Philip, Philip Lind or Lin uh, Ryan. What did you make of Tanner Bosa and, you know, how, how would the future matchup between Bosa and Morris Green go? I think he was the surprise of the night because he was fighting really highly rated. Uh, heavyweight who just hasn't looked that good over his last two fights now and I think Bowser um, he, he was one of those typical heavyweights I feel that UFC brings in now and again that's a heavy hitter but he just didn't have that much about him 
uh, previously. Whereas it looks like now he took it seriously. Um, he shed a lot of weight. He looked light on his feet. He struck well and he knocked uh, Linz clean out. And I don't know, like like Jay was saying about uh, what do you gain from from calling out Maurice Green now after he's beaten Jan Vellante. Maybe it's just a bit more personal, you know, just you just want to get a knockout over somebody who you don't feel particularly good towards. So maybe in terms of that, that's a decent call out. But he definitely looked good and seeing the... the um, how much the fighters got paid after that, that card. Bowser was definitely nowhere near any of the fighters that were getting paid the highest on the card. So I think that might be an incentive for him to look how he looked in that one. And maybe he's going to be somebody to look out for in the future for that top 15 of the heavyweight division. It's weird how uh, Lanes came in like, and people were just pretty excited by him. And that's two nasty KOs now for him. As well, what, what, like, uh, not envisioned that he's going to lose his contract with the UFC or anything like that but I don't know it must be hard coming in with all this hype and then right off the bat two back to back nasty KOs it's a tough one for him as well yeah definitely I, I agree and I think we're going to wrap it up here guys I'm going to ask you a question I'm going to say does Dustin Poirier versus Dan Hooker win fight of the year you know we're halfway through it now when we look back at the end of the year does he get, do they get that award I think, well, for me, it's obviously between that right now and uh, Joanna Wiley. And it's, that, that fight was crazy. I think the, the thing that makes maybe uh, Hooker and Poirier more impressive is just the power that they were hitting each other at and not dropping. It's obviously, it was heavier, heavier hitters. So it's maybe a little bit more impressive in terms of the damage taken that they were both standing on their feet, never dropping. And it was, it was like, but in terms of how close they were, they were both going down to the wire. I think nobody knew really in that um, Joanna Wiley fight who, who won that. I think maybe in this one, there, it was a little bit more obvious. I think more people were leaning towards Poirier because his performance was a little more dominant from three through five. So it's, it, it's going to be interesting because the fights are coming thick and fast now. Now we have another uh, stretch of fights coming where there is what going to be four in two weeks four fight cards in two weeks so it's going to be interesting but it's definitely a front runner for me like it's the, the kind of power that was on display the kind of damage that they took and the, the skill because they, they weren't just standing in the phone box throwing it was it was skilled fighting skilled punching good striking on display and so yeah it's definitely a front runner for me at this point yeah like Josh Emmett and Shane Borgos that's in the hat as well but I think what we've seen on Saturday will eclipse it I know what are saying about Joanna and Wiley Zhang that was a dog fight you know and I didn't personally think Joanna would be able to withstand all of that and she did she didn't look any, she looked like Joanna the champion you know and that for me was enough at that point I didn't think anything could eclipse it and what we've seen on Saturday like again I feel like I'm just copying Arian's answers here but like <laughs> it, 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 you have to think about it when it comes down to power like that everyone I hope you're getting big headed but everyone uh, like every shot that was, was thrown was power shots even the body shots that Hooker ripped Poirier with the knee at the end of the second and all and yet he still stays on his feet he comes back out and wins the next three rounds but he doesn't just win the next three rounds by keeping him at the end of a jab and just like outpoint him no nah, he went to war he went to finish him and he done it you see in his corner you having it how are you how is the feeling yeah I'm having a blast like that's that's a dog fight in you know and Poirier brings that every single time and yeah, for me, right now, that's the best fight of the year. But we still have another six months to go. Who knows? Jesus Christ. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy what, we're, what we've been given. You know, it's the end of a small cage for about a month or at least, you know, two, three weeks while we're either at Fight Island. So we are going to see maybe a difference in action. I know Dana White's been saying there's been no difference at all between the big and small cage. But we have well, been given... You, We've been given some treats in that small cage this this past couple, what, two months? I'd say keep it. <laughs> keep the small cage. <laughs> it is ridiculous. But yeah, I think we're going to make a we'll make a video this week about which fight's going to be a fight of the year. There's three notable contenders at the moment. So we'll, we'll leave that towards the end of the week. Mm -hmm. As I say, I'll add to it. I feel sorry for Dustin Poirier. He had that, that war with Max Holloway and he could find himself two years running coming second for fight of the year, only with Adesanya last year. And probably uh, Zhang Weili and Yoni and Jacob this year. But this weekend, we got given a, an absolute war. And I, I said to you earlier, 
this is one where we see it in a year or two's time. We're going to be sat down rewatching it in its full. And yeah, it's, <laughs> it, was, it was incredible. We're, we're going to see what, what the journey of Mike Perry and Natalie Gonzalez is going to happen in the future as well. But yes, make sure to hit that like button. Make sure to hit subscribe. Jay, where can they find you on Twitter? People can find me at Farrell underscore one. So it's not just the letter J, J A Y Farrell underscore one. You can find me there. Hey, so I always have to explain if it's some weird. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. And you're around? I mean, it's gonna to be tough to find me by just uh, by sp- spelling my name. But it's, it's <laughs> my, my first name is gonna be right here, and then my surname is Armeniakos. A R M E N. No worries. So that's me on Twitter. No so worries. what is it? Is it Aryan or Orion? I'm so confused. It's it's Aryan, but I'm just I'm I'm running with it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Mitch. You created. Which, which will, which will get it one day? I will. <laughs> I'll get there with the Irish names. I do apologise, but yes, we will see you guys on the next video where we will be discussing fight of the year contenders. But make sure to hit that subscribe button for now, and we'll see you on the next video.